fusion beat pseudo fusion beat okay and about the concept of hysteresis so what is hysteresis actually so hysteresis is actually is it increases the escape interval after a sensed intrinsic event actually and it allows extension time for more it gives an extra time actually for the additional intrinsic activity to happen so for example what do you see over here so when there is a intrinsic activity for example there are three intrinsic beats over here so there is a little bit of extra time what is called as the hysteresis so during that you allow it like let it get some extra time so that spontaneous beat may happen but it doesn't happen so you try to give it because you are trying to protect the patient's intermittent or intrinsic uh, conduction similarly you are trying to prevent the fusion or the pseudo fusion as well so coming to the disadvantages it has to be a rate which the patient can tolerate similarly if the hysteresis rate is too low it may cause a patient to become symptomatic for example angina or the patient may also feel easily fatigued so it should not be ideally used in patients who are having atrial fibrillation or flutter similarly frequent pvcs could cause frequent initiation of hysteresis so that's why a lot of times it is misunderstood and therefore it is misinterpreted as well so what do you notice in this uh, rhythm strip so for example the first one is a normal sinus beat pqrs t so then after that there is a normal inherent intrinsic p but after that there is a pacing spike followed by a not so usual QRS complex right so this is more of a fusion beat and then after there is a normal paced QRS spike spacing spike and QRS deflection depolarization same thing which is happening for the fifth beat as well sixth and seventh are inherent beats and then again the last two beats are all intrinsic uh, I would say like fusion beats and then what happens is so after the intrinsic beat over here the third last beat if you see so there is a gap which is given over here extra gap which is longer than the normal interval so in that you try to give it some time to allow it to be able to pace so what is dual chamber pacemaker dual chamber pacing is is in the atrium and the ventricle and you try to see the pacing or the sensing as well so what is the pace pacemaker syndrome so what happens is there's always a a and v synchrony in the sense atrial contraction happens first after that the ventricular contraction but a lot of times what happens is if the av synchrony is not there patient will start feeling bad due to which if you will be able to restore that av synchrony immediately the patient will tell doctor you did a magic thing with me and I really feel better so what about the leads so as you all know the dual chamber consists of two leads atrial and the ventricular lead and there is one pulse generator but having two circuits so what are the two circuits one circuit is for the atrial pacing and sensing and then of course the second one is for the ventricular ventricular pacing and sensing now coming to the dual chamber pacing so the rule of dual chamber pacing is to fill in the blanks for the patient in other words if the patient doesn't have a p wave then the pacemaker will pace in the atrium similarly if there is no r wave then the pacing will happen in the ventricle so these are these are again those ecgs beautiful ecgs which gives an example so what is happening over here so the first one is as well there is a pacing spike followed by a p wave then there is a narrow qrs right so this is the inherent qrs then you see a t wave again pacing, pacing spike p wave qrs t pacing spike p qrs t so the, there is a paced atrial 
pieced atrial beats and there is sensing of the ventricle. So then there is intrinsic P and R wave. So there are four states of dual chamber pacing. So what are those four states? You are going to see. So one is the AV pacing. Then AV. So as you saw it, and then something is called as AR. AR in the sense, A you paste it, but ventricular you are able to sense. So then this is PV sensing. Right? So finally is the PR pacing. So now coming to the timing cycles. So what are those timing cycles? So timing cycles refers to is the atrial dual chamber delay. For example, A V delay and P V delay. So what is this P VAP? The post yeah. Uh, I can't I can't hear you well. So so what is your question? Tell me. Yeah, I am going to discuss about it in detail soon, okay, just a second, I will come to about them in detail. So as I said it already, there is AV delay, there will be PV delay and also the PVAP, the atrial refractory period. So now coming to those delays, what is going to happen, how do they occur? So for example, at the starting of the P wave, which is paced beat, so if you try to take measure from the beginning of the P wave to the starting of the QRS, this is what is called as the AV delay. So how do you define it? Definition is the time frame between a paced P wave to the paced R wave and it is mimicking the PR interval. And always remember, whatever you express, most of the times you should express it in terms of milliseconds. Because, why milliseconds? Because they are all very small time intervals. And it is used for optimizing the ventricular feeling. So that is why a lot of times you have to give the EV delay. And then you want the, to optimize the cardiac output and similarly, of course, provide ventricular backup as well. Then comes the PV delay, right? So, so, few people were asking as well, PV delay. So, what is the meaning of PV delay? So, PV delay is actually the time frame between a sensed P wave to the paced R wave. So, there is a difference between, I hope you understood, AV delay, okay, and PV delay. Okay, remember it like this. PQRST is for the, the sinus or the surface ECG wave. A is normally used for the paced beat. So that is why, so for example, when you are trying to see from A to the paced beat, paced beat to the V, so it is it will be called as AV delay. Similarly, and if it will be from the PV, from the starting of the sends P wave to the paced R wave. So that's what it will be P V delay. V will refer to the ventricle, right? So again, you are trying to optimize the ventricular filling, optimizing the cardiac output. Similarly, you are trying also trying to provide the ventricular backup. So you are knowing the A V or P V delay. So what is happening over here? So, this is between the A and V, so what is called as the pacing interval. But what happens is, when there is an intrinsic beat, there is an intrinsic P wave, and over here there is a paced QRS, right? So what happens is, this is slightly going to be different, and I am going to show you the, uh, the difference as well. Okay, when we are trying to see the first complex over here, what do you notice? So the first one is also a paced A, 
the second one is a paste V. So this will be a V delay, right? So then if you try to see in the second complex, second complex as well is the same. There's a paste P, there's a paste V. So this will be both is the a V delay. However, in the third complex, there's an intrinsic P wave and there's a paste QRS complex, right? So then what is going to happen is this will be called as a PV delay. Similarly, in the last complex over here, you see a intrinsic P wave and there's a paste QRS complex. So this will be called as the PV delay. Got it? So now, one of the important terms which we had said it was PVAP. PVAP refers to the post-ventricular atrial refractory period. So now let's try to understand what does it mean actually. Post-ventricular atrial refractory period. So what happens is this is the time frame or the time when atrial channel is refractory. Okay. So normally this is initiated when there is a paste or a sensed R wave. So, so what is happening over here is, so for example, you see is a, there is a paste P wave. There is some isoelectric interval. Then there is a paste pacing spike. Then there is a QRS, right? So what is happening is, this is the time. Wh what happens is, oh, as you can see it over here, during this time, atrial channel is refractory. So whatever you do, you will not be able to get a atrial complex over there. Similarly, and there will be no, of course, sensed R wave as well. So this this time interval is expressed as the PVA, post-ventricular atrial refractory period. Again, expressed in terms of milliseconds. Don't forget. So th when there is a paste, uh, so in simple terms like this, you can break the word as well into its different part in the sense post-ventricular atrial refractory period. So for example, after there is a paste or sensed ventricle, the atria goes into refractory. So that is what is the PVAP. So then, atrial alert period. So what is the atrial alert period is? That's the time frame after the PVAP when the sense amplifier is open and can see the P waves. So for example, what is happening over here? So there is atrial alert period. Okay. There's a PVAP followed by atrial alert period. Right. Then again, there is a paste P complex. Then finally, after that, there is a paste QRS of course, associated with the PVAP, and finally again there is a alert period, right? So don't worry. One thing I would say as well, it ca it may happen to you guys is it takes time for you to build it up. I would say in the sense, uh, so don't worry. You may not be able to understand a lot of uh, like in the first time itself need to spend some time going through all this stuff again and again, go through again, read again, you will forget, again you will read, again you will forget, but again you must read, and that's how it goes on, okay? Let's keep going. So, then comes is the ventricular dual chamber timing cycles. So how do you do it? So using the ventricular refractory period, ventricular alert period, or V2A cycle. So the definition wise, that's the time frame after ventricular pacing pulse or an intrinsic R wave that the ventricular channel cannot see. So what do you notice over here? So there is a ventricular refractory period over here. So the <coughs> I'm sorry. So this is exactly the time frame or the time interval when the ventricular pacing pulse or intrinsic R wave is there and that ventricular channel cannot sense. So during this time, whenever, say for example in the first beat, what has happened is, there is a inherent QR. So during this time, it cannot sense. 
So that makes it a little bit tricky. But one thing is there, you will not be expected to know all these things. So you know some of these things, that will be pretty good enough for you guys. So coming to the ventricular alert period. Ventricular alert period is the time frame after the ventricular refractory period that the sense amplifier is open looking for R wave. So for example, in the ventricular alert period, so what is happening over here? So you notice is there is so 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 for example, what do you notice? So the first beat is a inherent beat, right? So that is why there is a ventricular refractory period, which is again followed by an intrinsic P wave, that's why, which is followed by the ventricular alert period, and so on. It keeps going. Then comes the VA interval. VA interval is the time frame from the ventricular contraction, either an intrinsic R wave or a ventricular pacing pulse to the next time the pacer will pace in the atrium. So, so you have to do the calculation for V to A interval. So how you do that? Programmed rate minus the programmed AV delay. So these are some of the values you should try to remember. The, these are important values. If you are trying to deal with the pacemaker programming, it's important. So V to A interval, how do you say? So for example, it of course starts from the V spike to the A spike. Okay. So for example, although if there is an intrinsic R wave as well, it will start in the same way. So this is how is the V A interval in terms of if there is an intrinsic P wave, uh, intrinsic activity or otherwise the paced activity. So there is something called as the rate responsive pacing. So as the name itself says, it's the use of a pacemaker with some type of sensor to adjust the pacing rate to meet the patient's metabolic needs. In the sense, so for example, if someone is chronic in incompetence, chronic incompetence, what is the problem is? The patients, even if, for example, is, one is running, it's, the heart is unable to increase its heart rate appropriately in response to the stress or exercise actually. So this is what happens. So for example, there will be a limit beyond which it will not be able to raise its heart rate. And it 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 will it is going to make the patient really symptomatic. The patient will not be able to do a lot of work. The patient is going to be really feel tired and all. So these are the things. And of course, there's it will be failure to achieve the peak heart rate in fact. So what is the goal for the rate responsive pacing? You are trying to provide an increased heart rate for the chronic incompetent patient so that the patient can lead a better life, right? So what you do is you use a pacemaker which get, allows you to program a minimum rate and a maximum rate. And so you also try to see for the sensor input. So how is it going? And on the basis of that, at a certain rate, between minimum and maximum, you try to do the pacing work. So for example, if someone is doing exercise, so what are the changes you are going to see? So what happens is, of course, so if one is doing exercise, the what is going to increase? The heart rate will is going to increase. Even the oxygen saturation level is going to increase. The cardiac output also increases. Similarly, the body height as well increases, right? And then what is called as MVO. So, for example, minute volume ventilation, and that also increases as well. Although the QT may shorten, in fact. So, movement is going to happen. 
So what are these centers, sensors which you are using? The sensors which we use in nowadays world, they are very smart, they are very efficient and they are really good. So what happens? Uh, not only uh, they are non-physiologic sensors, for example, for the vibration or the acceleration, whatever is going to happen. Similarly, it's also physiologic in the sense, so they will also be taking care for the minute ventilation. So how much do you, you know, in every minute, how much are you, how much capacity of air are you breathing in or breathing out? Similarly, they, you do also have the sensors for the temperature as well. Activity sensor, why is it important is, for example, if you are sitting, if you are just standing or maybe sometimes you are running as well. So it needs to adapt to all these kind of activities. So what is going to happen is, of course, when someone is lying down, you try to set up those patients for a lower threshold. Similarly, if one is going to be walking, you will reprogram or it, it should be earlier earlier program itself in response to the need of the patient. So what is VVIR? Does anyone remember this? What is VVIR? So VVIR, if anyone will remember, what was the NAPSE code? Pace, sense, response, modulation and response to tachycardia. So what is happening is patient is pacing is happening in the ventricle, sensing also in the ventricle, although there is inhibition when an R wave is sensed. Although of course it can increase the heart rate depending upon the sensor. So what is called is a rate modulated pacing. Rate modulated pacing is a sensor driven pacing with <coughs> moderate exercise. So for example, if someone does a little bit of exercise, the rate is also going to increase further. So then comes triple DR. So there is pacing in the atrium and the ventricle. And there is sensing in the both the chambers as well. And it is able to inhibit in not only atrium but also ventricle as well. And it is able to track the atrial activity in the ventricular channel. Similarly, it does increase the pacing rate based upon sensor input. So what about the rate modulated pacing? So what is happening is, when you use a temporary pacing, you all know, you try to use a temporary wire using the bilateral. Among, among the bilateral, whichever suits you, most of the times they try to choose the right-sided one itself. So what are those temporary pacing ones? It can be against single chamber ventricular. Yes, the good advantage is prevents bradycardia. Among the disadvantages for the single chamber pacemaker is there is no AV synchrony. So what do you do for the temporary pacing? When the someone is already having a heart attack or some complication. So you can try to do also do a dual chamber pacemaking. So coming to the advantages. So it does prevent bradycardia, it maintains AV synchrony and the, regarding the disadvantages, there is chronic AFib or flutter and of course there can be misplacement of the two leads. So as you all know, the temporary pacemaker is, a, is in VVI mode and that is what it is also there in the oldest pacemaker which came to India okay so what happens is 
how do you do that so there are also some of the uh, temporary pacing modes but in like the ddd mode as well so ddd will be pace sense response so a lot of times how do you interact with the permanent pacemakers so you, what is called as magnetic response so you try to use a magnet to only pace in the chamber asynchronously and if the magnet response is programmed on the VOO or DOO so for example what about the chances of interaction of pacemakers with the devices yes they can react adversely to the MRI so that is why it is contraindicated because of the extremely high magnetic forces as it may cause the reed switch to close otherwise asynchronous pacing similarly it can also cause inhibition or rapid pacing so if a physician seems necessary patient should be monitored during the procedure and the pacemaker should be evaluated that before this uh, before the MRI scan is there any need as well or how to even program it your device in fact so it also interacts with the external defibrillator so you should never place the paddles over the pacemaker so this is something which you have to know and it's always said it is better when you leave a gap of almost four inches and you have to use the ap position if possible and then regarding the interactions with permanent pacemakers you we all know radiation therapy for example coming out from the linear accelerator or cobalt can not only damage but also destruct the pa patients and there was a new fashion as well which was causing some problems about like this so in the sense how do you sh shield those pace pacemakers so what happens is whenever a patient is with pacemaker is undergoing radiation therapy you should try to shield the pacemaker and if the pacemaker is lying in the treatment area, maybe try to get it changed. Similarly, evaluate the pacemaker always before and after each treatment. So now we'll try to speak about some tips and tricks. How do you troubleshoot them? So the systemic approach is of course trying to determine the system of source of problem who is the patient, in which lead is it, and the pacemaker. And of course, you should never forget your patient as well. Trying to underline the rhythm, electrolyte imbalance, drug therapy, or even acid site, or the last but not the least, the lead site. So for example, in the atrium or the ventricle, how do you evaluate the lead? Is it a epicardial, endocardial, acute or chronic? And where is it? So is it in the chamber? It should be. Otherwise, is it connected well enough? So as I had already said, sometimes you may have to evaluate the pacemaker. Try to figure it about the... So what will you try to see for? So for example, sometimes when you see the ECG carefully you may notice there's failure to pace so how do you notice it is you will not be seeing any apparent spike on the ECG and the heart rate is going to be lesser than the lower limit so you may see is the junctional or ventricular junctional beat so the possible causes for this can be lead fracture loose connection or even if the cable is not fully inserted so for the if you have a pacemaker you will try to see for the battery failure or output program to, 
is too low. So, if there is a patient with a failure, you may land up in a trouble like is if you are not able to see any pacing spikes so what do you do you must always check for the patient's safety first for example call up your doctor only if needed apply your external pacer if needed and then yes if there is demand of too much problems if you may notice you have to be careful with the external pacer, atropin or the increased output. Same way you have to check for the connections, replace a temporary battery always. Huh? You need to maybe sometimes even change the box or the cables. So what are the reasons for failing to capture? It may happen due to the signs and symptoms like outward spike is not followed by depolarization. Okay, so now coming to the lead problems. So if the lead is having dislodgement or fracture, that can also cause failure to capture. So a pacemaker, even after an insertion, so when you are when you are noticing there is failure to contract, you should get it checked for the polarity with the pacemaker. If you are somewhere alone and you notice that there is failure to capture, what do you do? Of course, you will try to increase the output to the higher level. Similarly, you will try to determine cause threshold or program safety programs and also you should never forget to check for the battery status the polarity or the proper chamber is there as well and sa same way check and tighten the cables and connections so that's a private feature of one of the pacemakers what is called as auto capture it tends to automatically adjust the output of the patient with the other patient as well. So what do you notice over here? So, and this is there is loss of capture, but it is associated with. So what do you notice over here? So there are few things. There are few complex things which you are able to notice. There is capture, of course. There is loss of capture, and sometimes also backup safety pulse as well, which is coming into play. So what do you notice over here? Anyone would like to try? So what do you notice? So what you notice over here is failure to sense or there is under sensing over pacing. So what do you how do you diagnose? You will be seeing pacing stimuli which is coming too early that does not even sense intrinsic rhythm and the patient will be having problems with palpitations. So that is why these phenomena are very, very important and you have to be really careful. So you need to also know about the causes for under sensing. Okay. So for example, it can be causes associated with the patient, even with the lead as well. So these are some of the causes, frequent causes you all should try to be careful. So whenever if there is under sensing, what are you going to do? You will be checking is the sensitivity settings. Right? And then you have to also recheck the sensing threshold as well. And you should reposition the leads and evaluate how are the refractory periods. 
and change the battery. Yes, if there is a lot of problem, you have to change the battery. There is no solution other than that. Similarly, if there is over sensing or under sensing, so what are the problems? What are the problems with which they are going to present to you? So they will be pacing at rates lower than the program rate. Similarly, there will be erratic prolongation of pacing interval. Similarly, if you come across persistent over sensing, which may reappear. which may reappear. So that's why then again you have to be careful. So for example, what is happening over here? This is a beautiful example of the over sensing over here. Another example, one more example. So over sensing is your extra sensing which you are not supposed to sense. So myopotentials, electromagnetic interference. Similarly for the pacemaker as well, you did not program it well. Phenomenon of crosstalk. So if there is this problem is happening, you should check for the connections, adjust the blanking periods. Similarly, during the diaphragmatic or chest wall stimulation, hiccups may happen, which may be intermittent. So the possible lead a lot of times is due to the leads, myocardial perforation or lead fracture or even sometimes due to the insulation break. So the pacemaker may be associated with the high output. So you try to reduce the output to maintain the capture. Okay. Of course, if possible, try to see which lead is the culprit, the A or the V, and accordingly you will be able to take care. If it is fractured, of course, you will change the lead. Similarly, on a temporary basis, you can always reduce the rate till the permanent pacemaker of fibrillation is arranged. Okay, so I think a lot of people are already aware of what is called as pacemaker mediated tachycardia. So, mostly seen in dual chamber tracking modes in which the P tracking pacing is at or near the upper rate limit. Patient may have palpitations or even the hypotension as well. It is happening due to the loss of atrial capture or a PVC. Similarly, the retrograde conduction of the impulse causes atrial depolarization. Right? So why I have tried to insert so many figures is it will be easier for you all to learn it whenever you are trying to go through all these textbooks and all. So if there is pacemaker tachycardia, immediately apply a magnet. Okay. But yes, you must not forget, even the magnet, they themselves can cause all these problems. So, since we are approaching towards the end of the session, so what else is left? Anything happens, always put it in papers. Document, document, and document. Okay, so that's really, really important. Never forget that. And whatever you do and all, 